Welcome to Acres Financial Group Winning in Retirement Classroom Session. I'm Brian Akers, I'm president of Acres Financial Group, and we welcome you here today to our second session. Thank you very much for coming. And as a reward for coming, if this is your first session you've been to, we have the amazing prizes that we had at the last show two weeks ago. So those that have signed up new for this one, here you go on some of the prizes. We have the amazing jar opener, the Winning in Retirement named after a radio show on Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. The Winning in Retirement Jar Opener can open basically almost anything. We also have a notebook, not good for our talk today because you won't get it to after this, but what will happen is this. You need to, this will be part of the package mailed to you. And then the amazing microfiber cloth sponsored by Acres Financial Group with our sunflowers and everything. We brought this back because of its popularity among our clients. Thanks again for coming today to our classroom session. We have a lot of things um, ready for you today. We have two speakers and we want you to be ready for that. Um, of course, we're doing this classroom session because we could not do our retirement expo this year. Our retirement expo in April was postponed to September, up to September 11th, and then we also decided to cancel that. Instead, we're doing one hour classroom sessions every two weeks that we're showing live every two weeks, Thursday at 4 p.m. The live video will then go to our website at acresfinancial.com under webinars and you'll see the recording if you want to hear this again or if this might be your first time listening to the recording through that site. Today's talk is about retirement income. We have our speaker Sam Payne from AMS. He actually lives in California. He's a RIA and an insurance agent and a business consultant that I've worked with for a number of years. He's been speaking at our expo for the last five years, and today he's going to talk about annuities, everything you need to know, but we're afraid to ask. And right after that will be my cousin, who's been at Acres Financial Group 20 years as of this September. He's put up with me for 20 years, but he's mostly, um, and what I'm grateful for is he's, he's served our clients for the last 20 years um, through Acres Financial Group and our previous employer. What we want to do today is talk about retirement income. What Jeff's going to talk about is retirement income when it comes to why we need to be concerned about our retirement income and how to provide for it. That's what our talk's going to be today. On the webinar that we have during the live show, what you'll have is an ability to enter into a chat box down on the right-hand side. Chat box, you can ask questions, you can say hello. I will have someone there saying hello to you throughout the show. Thank you for listening and enjoy um, Sam Payne as he brings annuities, everything you need to know, but we're afraid to ask. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for allowing me to be part of your educational event today. Of course, my topic is annuities, what everybody should know about annuities, but maybe you just didn't think to ask. And if you think about annuities, and especially the importance of annuities today, you really need to go back in time a little bit to understand just why they're as, they're as important today as they are. So travel with me, if you will, back to, let's say, mid-1970s. In the mid-1970s, the federal government recognized that the average person, just the average American, just is not saving enough for retirement. So they enacted a law. And this law incented individuals to save more for retirement, and the Individual Retirement Arrangement, or IRA, was born. A couple of years later, there was a loophole that was identified within the IRS tax code that allowed employers to pay employees into an account that they could save for their retirement going forward. Now, both of these accounts, and then that second one, of course, was the 401k. So we have the IRA, Individual Retirement Arrangement, and the 401k, which is a profit sharing plan. Both of these plans allowed you to contribute to the plan and contribute with pre-tax dollars. In other words, you wouldn't have to pay taxes on the dollars you earned in the year that you contributed to these plans and that money would sit in those plans and at some point in the future it would grow. At some point in the future you would take it out and you would pay tax on it at that point at the then tax rate. Great, great tool, great strategy to help people start saving for retirement. More, more and more employees decided that they wanted these 401ks and these IRAs and so companies started adopting utilizing 401ks and offering 401ks and actually helping fund and match some of the contributions. And so beginning in the 1980s, really when things started taking off, there were, there have been a multitude of insurance agents and financial advisors and registered representatives and stockbrokers and bank employees, all kinds of individuals who would gladly 
help these employees or these individuals, these retirement savers determine one, how much to save and two, where to invest it. But in reality, how much to save and where to invest it, that's just half the story. You see, prior to these retirement accounts being, being available, most employers, large employers, had pension plans. And pension plans were very simple. You, you work for a company for so many years, and if you work for them for so many years, they give you an income for life and you leave. It's a pension. It's a true pension. It was a burden that the employer had to hold. They had to save the right amount of money, invest it properly, and then once you got to retirement, they had to continue giving you payment for the rest of your life. So the first burden that was placed upon the shoulder of the employee was determining how much to save and where to invest it in the 401k or the IRA. The second more consequential burden is being realized in the last five to 10 years and will be realized for several years going forward. And that's the burden of taking the accumulated assets, whatever you save, and turning that into an income that will last a lifetime. In reality, that's what annuities are. So with that little bit of background, let me get into my presentation here real quick. Let me share my screen with you. So annuities, everything you should know but didn't think to ask about annuities. First and foremost, every presentation we give in our industry requires disclosures. And the disclosures basically in this, in this presentation, the disclosures are annuities are a financial tool. They are long-term investments. You need to know what you're getting into. And if you sit down with Brian, with Jeff, with Alex, with Bernie, these individuals will explain specifically what you're getting into, the, what, why it is the best financial tool for you. So my, my, my advice to you is to make sure you communicate with your financial advisor, certainly communicate with Brian and Alex and Jeff and Bernie. It's like we said before, 401ks are a great retirement savings tool. But 401ks, when you couple them with the income producing benefits, guaranteed lifetime income benefits that annuities provide, they make a substantial tool that, that work in concert with the, each other to help secure your retirement, specifically retirement income. Now this presentation is just one of many presentations that Acres Financial gives as part of their education series. And I'm proud to be a part of it. I would, I would implore you to Make sure you keep your eyes open to your emails and to the newsletters that Acres Financial sends out and be part of the other topics that they have educational series on. So annuities, what we wanna basically talk on in this or discuss in this presentation are the basics of annuities. What, what is an annuity? We're gonna talk about four different types of annuities. We're gonna talk about the benefits or the current laud, the you know, people who are, who are expressing excitement about annuities in a diversified portfolio. We're going to talk about some valuable add-ons or what we call riders to annuities. And then this is all around the question that should be asked is, is an annuity right for you? So first thing, why an annuity? Well, the number one concern for retirees today is having income that will last a lifetime. An annuity by definition is designed to pay an income for life. Annuity in its purest form, by definition, is an income for life. It's designed to provide an income stream for either life or a specific period of time. In addition, it also provides some tax deferral. You don't pay taxes on the dollars till you take them out. Annuities oftentimes are used for specific purposes in financial planning, and one of the ways they're used is to ensure some aspects of investing, like, protecting the income or ensuring the income off of the specific asset, specific dollar amount, um, protecting legacy, guaranteeing that there is an amount left for a legacy perspective, guaranteeing a return or ensuring a return on a specific dollar amount, an asset. And then lastly, another one is principal, guaranteeing the principal, protecting the principal, ensuring the principal, the fact that the amount of money you give to the insurance company that sits in annuity and in a lot of annuities, not a lot of them, but a lot of annuities is protected. It can't be lost because of market or sequence of returns risk. Pretty important. 
Now, I've been doing this a long time and there's a lot said about a lot of financial tools and annuities is one of the ones that gets the worst, worst press and sometimes the best press. But there's a lot of fake news out there and our perceptions sometimes are based on something other than reality. And I like to use a, an example of that, something that we see in our daily lives where our perceptions probably are something different than what's there. And let's start with, if you would think of in your mind, picture a stop sign. And if you think of a stop sign, you know it's got eight specific sides. It's an octagon, right? It's an octagon and the colors of a stop sign are very unique and distinct. Yeah, they are red and white. You can have a, a stop sign, it's red and white. It can say stop, it can say are, it can say alto, pare, it can say vergente. It can say a lot of things, but instinctively, anywhere in the world you see an octagon shaped sign that's red and white, you know what you gotta do, you gotta stop. There's another sign that we see on a regular basis on our, on our highways, and it's the yield sign. And if I was to ask you to conjure up an image of a yield sign, I would bet you a lot of you would answer the same way 99.9% .9 of the people I've asked over the last 10 years answer. And that is your image is this, a yellow and black sign, upside down, upside down triangle that's yellow and black. That's the image that comes to your mind immediately. Matter of fact, I do these, do these questions um, in groups, large groups, and immediately, definitively, without question, I get the answers of the colors of a yield sign of yellow and black immediately. The problem is the yield sign is red and white and it's been red and white since September of 1971, almost 50 years, 49 years this month. It's been red and white, yet most of us, when we think of a yield sign, immediately what comes to mind is yellow and black. See, our, our perception is something different than what's there. I challenge you to go out and find a yellow and black yield sign on a state, federal, county, municipal street. They don't exist. They're not approved for use on state streets and haven't been for 49 years. I had a guy who sold 3M signs to cities and municipalities, answered the same way, yellow and black immediately, no, definitively, no question. And when I told him they were red and white, he says, you know, you're right. I've been, I sell these things. I should know this. Something was clouding his mind. What he thought was there, the colors he thought was on that sign, those weren't the colors. There's probably some things in your financial world when it comes to financial strategies, tools, or concepts where you might have the same type of perceptions. What I try and do when I talk about annuities is ask people to set those perceptions aside. Let's talk about fact and fact only, not somebody else's opinion. When it comes to definitive statements, and there are a lot of definitive statements that are made about annuities, these are some of the definitive statements that are made. And let me tell you that they're not true. At the death, at death, the insurance company keeps your money. That definitive statement is false. You have no access to funds. That definitive statement is false. Money's locked up. That definitive statement is false. When you run out of money, it's over. Also false. Income is only for one life. Also false. Money goes to propate. Also false. You can't take a lump sum. Also false. So let's talk about some basics of annuities and try and answer some of these questions with reality. There are two basic types of annuities, an immediate annuity and a deferred annuity. An immediate annuity is an annuity or a contract with the insurance company where they must begin income payments to you, the annuitant, within 12 months. So immediate would, be, would obviously give it away that you got to have income within 12 months. That's the important thing about an immediate annuity. Now that income can last for a specific period, a period certain, or it can last for a lifetime. It's intended to generate income for a life. Now, once this annuitization starts, once you start receiving that income, it's generally irreversible and you can't, you can't, change it. You can't change beneficiaries. Um, you cannot reverse it typically. What you own is that income, not the asset that is generating the income. The second type is a deferred annuity. And as the name would imply, the annuitization can happen over 12 months from the date you give the money to the insurance company. Now, most deferred annuities never enter the annuitization phase and deferred annuities are the number one the biggest seller in annuities today. 
we don't see immediate annuities used that often. Deferred annuities, absolutely. When it comes to deferred annuities, the differentiating factor is how interest is credited or how your money grows. And we're gonna talk about three different ways or three different contracts, three different types of annuities that allow your money to grow in three different ways. One is a fixed rate of return. Another is, the second is an ind indexed or equity indexed rate of return. And the last is a variable rate of return. So, <clears throat> an immediate annuity pays a, you can have a period certain, in other words, an, an annuity where it pays for a specific period of time. That period of time can be five years, can be 10 years, can be 15 years. You can also have an immediate annuity that pays for a lifetime or joint lives, husband and wife. You can also have an immediate annuity that has both a period certain and a lifetime income. Now you look at that versus a deferred annuity where there isn't an income that starts immediately. And that deferred annuity, again, we talked about earlier, the, the differentiating factor is how interest, how, how it grows. What's, what's the dollars inside that contract? What are they invested in? What are the ways that interest is credited to that? So let's talk about an immediate annuity. This is an example, again, immediate annuity, period certain. You can get an income for five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. Typically, that is not a strategy that I would suggest today unless somebody is very, very bad with money or somebody has a specific cash flow that they want immediately. Because today with low interest rates, you don't, there isn't much, there isn't much of a benefit to doing so. So a specific period certain only immediate annuity may not be the best strategy for you. Unless you're trying to fund a specific thing, you've got a loan you're, you're funding it with over a five or 10 year period or a life insurance or something. Lifetime income, on the other hand, is a strategy that certainly is beneficial for certain individuals in certain scenarios. Whether it works for you or not, that's a great question for Brian and Alex and Jeff and Bernie. But lifetime income, as the name would imply, pays an income for life, either your life or yours plus somebody else's life, the annuitant plus the joint annuitant's life. And somebody will receive the money for as long as those two are alive. Either one of them will receive the money. Now, the third strategy is to combine those two, and that's to have a lifetime income with a period certain. So you could have a life annuity, let's just say one person, life annuity, and um, have a 20-year period certain. What that means is somebody is going to get paid for 20 years, at least 20 years, at least the, uh, either the annuitant, the person receiving it, the person that sets it up, or the annuitant's beneficiary. If the annuitant passes away after seven years, then the beneficiary will continue to receive those payments for another 13 years. If the annuitant lives to for 30 years, then they receive income for the full 30 years. So great strategy, great way to one, guarantee that you've got an income for a specified period of time, and two, guarantee that you've got a lifetime income. And there's pluses and minuses of doing that. And again, that's, those are great questions for Acres Financial. So we talked about immediate annuity. Now let's talk about, let's talk about deferred annuities. And then, like I said before, the differentiating factor in deferred annuities is how interest is credited to the account, to the cash, to the money you put in there. A fixed annuity credits a specified rate for a specified period of time, either one year or multiple years. And that rate is declared in advance of the period. So if I've got a one year period, they're gonna tell me in advance what rate I'm gonna get on that contract for the next year. We see a lot of multi-year guarantee annuities where the guarantee, the fixed rate that's declared is guaranteed for three, five, seven, 10 years. We'll explain how that works in just a minute. So, but recognize that a fixed annuity, your interest is declared in advance. You know how much it's gonna earn for whatever the period that you're using. An indexed or equity index annuity, contrary to a fixed annuity, you don't have a declaration of exactly what kind of rate of return you're gonna get at the beginning. That declaration, uh, the, the interest is not determined until after the period to determine where the index did. You're actually getting your, your growth is based on the performance of an index. An index like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or the Russell, or there are a multitude of of new indexes that have been created that are dynamically 
balanced and dynamically managed to avoid volatility. But you don't know what kind of return you're, you're getting until the end of your period, whether it's one, two, five years. Typically, we see one years. The index is based on a stock or bond index, like the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow, Russell 2000, and a bunch of others. So important to recognize, you're not invested in the, the market. You're not invested in the stocks and bonds. You're not invested in equities. Your return is based on the performance of equities without having ownership of them. Does that make sense? Hope so. The last type of annuity is a variable annuity. And in a variable annuity, unlike an indexed annuity or a fixed annuity, your principal is invested in mutual fund-like sub-accounts. And those mutual fund-like sub-accounts can go up and down. In a fixed annuity, indexed annuity, your principal can't go backwards because of the market. In a variable annuity, they certainly can. And so a variable annuity, you have the exposure of the market. So you have all the upside of the market, but you also have all the downside of the market. With that, you've got tax deferral. So three different strategies, fixed, indexed, and variable. Let's talk a little bit about the life cycle of a fixed annuity. And again, a reminder, principal and any gains in a fixed annuity are protected. Can't go backwards. In a fixed annuity, you save a bunch of money, you give it to the insurance company, it sits there and grows at whatever rate they've declared to you. So some point in the future, you take it out. You use it for medical expenses or income or some other thing that you've planned uh, to use it for. It's a good thing to understand that all annuities have tax deferral. Uh, you don't pay taxes on the dollars until you take them out. And if there are not an IRA or a 401k, the taxes you pay will be on the gain and the gain only. If it's an IRA or 401k, the taxes are on all the dollars coming out. An index annuity, same scenario, you save a bunch of money, give it to the insurance company, it accumulates not on a specified rate of return, but based on the performance of the index, your principal and any gains that have been credited to the account are guaranteed and protected. They can't go backwards because of the market. And at some point in the future, you're going to take that money out and you're going to use it again for some expenses, maybe medical expenses as, a, as an income writer or something else that you have decided you want to save the money for, maybe leave it as a legacy. And the last cycle is a variable annuity. Unlike the first two, fixed and index, the accumulation, your, your cash account can go up or down based on the performance of the index or the, the, the uh, sub accounts. It can go up and down daily. So you save a bunch of money, you give it to the insurance company, you put it into the accumulation account, you choose what you're going to invest in. It grows, it, it'll go like this, but over time, typically like the market, it should grow. And then at some point in the future, just like the others, you're gonna take it out, you're gonna use it for income, for medical expenses, for legacy, for something else. So that's the basic cycle. Take money, give it to the insurance company, Insurance company credits interest based on what type of annuity it is, and you take it out at some point in the future for income or something else. Here's an example of a fixed interest annuity. This is a five-year, multi-year guarantee annuity. This one is illustrating a 3% fixed rate of return for the first five years. Now, at the end of the first five years, the company could either reset for another five years at a new interest rate or the current interest rate, or some of them just go to one year declared rates after that. It all depends on the carrier. But for those five years, you've got a guarantee of 3% every year for the five years. Typically at the end of five years, you have an option to do something else with the money or continue re-sign up for another um, index period, uh, fixed interest period. Typically there's a minimum guaranteed rate that's at the end of your guarantee period that they cannot go below. 1%, 1.5%, something like that, or 80.87%, who knows, but there is typically a minimum. These are great tools, and we're seeing a lot of people take advantage of them today, where you're not getting much of a return in a CD. Same scenario, where you've got a guaranteed rate of return for three to five to seven years, even if the market goes like this, so the market doesn't do much for the next five to seven years, you know you're getting the interest rate, whatever that's credited. Right now, five-year migas are around 2.5% a, 
I don't think we see much for a 3% right now. And an indexed interest annuity, like we said, is you don't know what kind of return you're going to get. You have the interest is dependent on the performance of an index and it happens after the term, at the end of the term, not at the beginning of the term. So typically these terms are one year long. So an S&P, we'll look at the S&P 500, it's at a thousand today. I know it's a lot more than that, but for math's sake, a thousand today grows to 1100. That's a 10% growth. They look at it at the end of 12 months. If it's at 1100, that's a 10% growth. Index annuities have caps. They have participation rates. They have spreads. You want to make sure you understand what those are. This this example shows a 5% cap. What that means is you'd never have a loss because the market goes down. So they're not going to give you 100% of the upside. They got to cap the upside. In this scenario, it's 5%. So if the index over 12 months, if that's our, if that's our measuring stick, over 12 months grew by 3%, your cash, your account, your annuity would be credited 3% in interest. If it went up by 11%, you would be credited 5% because of the cap. If it went down by 7%, you'd be credited with zero. No loss, but no gain either. So very, very important to understand that indexed annuities don't have negative rates. You cannot go backwards. If the market goes down, you won't have a loss, but you certainly won't have, you won't have any gain either. So it's protecting what you've learned, what you've had before. You also don't have to recover from the index being down for the next period to determine another growth. And that's a, that's a thing to discuss with uh, the guys at Acres, with Brian, Jeff, Alex, and Bernie. Contrast that, those two, where your principal is protected, you have gains that are locked in and protected going forward with a variable annuity. Variable annuity is a, is a contract, like we said before, where you're actually invested in sub-accounts, mutual fund-like sub-accounts. And Variable annuities historically have fees. Some are fairly substantial, but in this example, let's just say 2% fees, which is at the low end of what I've seen as an average. But 2%, if the stocks, if your, your, your funds, your invested funds, your sub accounts go up by 10%, then you'll have 8% credited because of the fee. You have 8, 10% minus 2% gives you 8%. If the account goes down by 7%, 17%, you actually have a loss of 19%. If they go up back up by 5%, you gain 3%. And if they gain 1%, you actually lose 1%. Very important to note that in a variable annuity, your sub accounts can go up and down and the fees do detract from whatever growth there is. Your principal typically is not protected nor are the gains protected. So not a bad product for the right person. You just need to understand what the product does, what, what kind of a tool it is. So I know I'm going quickly, but I'm trying to get this done within a specific time period. We've talked about immediate annuities. We've talked about deferred annuities. How about, uh, here's some things I want everybody to make sure that you understand. Typically all deferred annuities, um, well, all the deferred annuities, any withdrawals are, are treated as if gains are coming out and taxes are near income. It's called LIFO, last in, first out. So the last dollars credited to the account are assumed to be the first dollars coming out. So you'll always have your gain coming out first and any withdrawals that are subject to tax are subject to ordinary income tax. For the tax deferral that annuities give, like IRAs, there is a caveat. There's a, a price to pay, and the price is you can't touch it without a penalty prior to 59 and a half. If you access the funds prior to 59 and a half, you pay ordinary income tax on the gain coming out. If it's an IRA, all of it coming out, plus you got a 10% penalty on top of that. So there are some exceptions that you can use to access the funds prior to 59 and a half. I think there's five or six exceptions, but they're very distinct and very unique and nothing outside of those exceptions will waive that 10% rule except for the CARES Act this year. So if you're looking to make a distribution, take some money out before 59 and a half and you've been financially affected by, by COVID-19, then the CARES Act for this year may be something you want to sit down and talk with Brian or Alex or Jeff or Bernie about. Now, the last thing is most annuities have commissions, fees, or sales charges built into the, to the contract. 
So you don't necessarily see what those are. They don't affect the dollar amount that you put into the contract. Let's talk about annuities in a diversified portfolio. Typically, there are three strategies for generating income in retirement. One is called the systematic withdrawal strategy. The second is called a time segmented or bucket strategy. And the last one, which it didn't get on here, is the essential versus discretionary expenses strategy. These three strategies all have unique attributes and unique characteristics. They all work very, very well, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But the systematic withdrawal basically is taking a specific percentage of an asset, adjusting it for inflation annually, and in doing so, uh, doing so in such a manner that the, the portfolio lasts for a specific period of time. There are Monte Carlo simulations that are done based on returns that have happened historically and averages and hypotheticals, illustrations you're gonna put in there that will tell you what you can, what your percentage you can withdraw. There was a time 5% was the number. 5% should be should, should last a lifetime. That number's dropped significantly. And there's some debate in our industry as to what that number actually is. And that number only is based on what we think the market's going to do going forward. So if we think the market's gonna be taken off going forward, you can have a higher withdrawal rate. But if you think the market's not going to go higher or maybe stay stagnant or maybe go down, then that withdrawal rate has to be reduced for it to last an average person's lifetime. The second is time segmented or bucket strategy. Imagine if you will, three buckets, three buckets of money. The first bucket you're gonna use relatively soon. The second bucket you're not gonna use for a while. And the third bucket you're not gonna use for a long time. Those three buckets can be invested differently, all three of them, because they have different time periods that you're going to be needing them. The near-term bucket, that first five-year bucket, you're going to have to be very conservative with that because you need that cash. That six to 10-year bucket, maybe not, not need to be quite so conservative. And that 10, 11, 12-year plus bucket, you can be substantially more aggressive with and not quite so conservative if you choose. So another great strategy. And the last one is the essential versus discretionary, where your essential expenses in retirement are covered by guaranteed sources of income. Things like a pension, if you've got one, social security and annuities. Those guaranteed sources of income pay for your roof over your head, transportation, healthcare, uh, food, all the essential things you need in life. Then you've got your discretionary, the things you want to do, the things you'd like to do, that's paid with other sources of income, not necessarily guaranteed sources of income. Now, within a diversified portfolio, there's a lot of press coming out. A lot of pundits are weighing in on utilizing annuities within a diversified portfolio. Individuals like Wade Fowle, who is a, who is a research fellow at the American Institute, American, um, American College for Financial Services, he says that uh, the unique benefits of risk pooling in annuities can enhance and truly diversify retirement in the in retirement income planning process. He likes that protected lifetime income. He likes that personal pension. You save your 401k, now let's turn it into a guaranteed income that lasts your lifetime, regardless of how long that lifetime is. Another stalwart in our industry is a gentleman named Roger Ibbotson, who's been around a long time. He suggests that indexed annuities might be a great bond alternative because over the last 20 years, there's been a a, there's been a bond bull market thanks to declining interest rates. Well, interest rates are low and they're supposed to be low, according to the Fed, for several years. And then when now that they're so low, they've only got one way to go and that's up. And when they do go up, it affects the value of bonds. He's saying these indexed annuities would be a great alternative, at least if nothing else, work in concert with a bond portfolio. So again, another thing to talk to Brian and Alex and Jeff and Bernie about. Let's talk a little bit about these valuable add-ons or riders. And we're gonna talk about an income rider that is typically attached to either an indexed annuity or a variable annuity. And an, end, an income rider is a way of ensuring longevity risk. It guarantees an income for a lifetime um, that you cannot outlive. Yet, if you pass away too soon, then there is something left. There's a benefit left for heirs. And these riders can be either a withdrawal benefit or what's called an annuitization benefit. And it's nothing more than a way of calculating a future stream of income. In a 
Deferred annuity, indexed annuity, variable annuity, with an income rider, you typically, if you can imagine, two separate buckets of money. One bucket of money is the money you give the insurance company and the growth it's accumulating based on the index or the sub accounts or whatever, whatever growth you're using, whatever period uh, product you're using. The separate bucket is a virtual bucket of money. It's a bucket of money that is not cash. It's got one job and one job only. And its job is to determine upon what dollar amount you can take a specific contractually obligated withdrawal amount percentage for the rest of your life and have it last a lifetime. That's all it is. It's just a dollar amount. Here's an example of a deferred annuity with an income rider during the accumulation phase. The bucket on your left is the cash. It's, your, it's what your money's actually earning. The bucket on the right is that virtual bucket, that make-believe bucket. It's not real income. It's just got one job, one job only, and it's to determine a dollar amount upon which you can take a withdrawal. On the left side, your cash, let's say it's growing at 2.5% per year. Over 10 years, if you got a 2.5% average rate of return, you'd have $128,000 on a $100,000 principal. In the income rider, it's guaranteeing that the income, the um, dollar amount that the income is going to be based on is going to grow at 7% per year. Not unlike, it could be like Social Security, waiting four years, getting 8% growth in the income. This is all about income, not cash. So it's going to grow in this, this um, example at 7% per year. So the $100,000 you start with grows to $196,000. Now, here's the question. If you were taking a specific percentage per year from the account, which dollar amount would you prefer to have that percentage based on? Example, 4%. Would you rather have 4% of 128,000 last a lifetime? Or would you rather have 4% of 196,000 last a lifetime? Well, most people would rather have the 4% of 196,000. Now I'm making this simplistic. There are a lot of moving parts to all annuities, specifically indexed and variable annuities. But that's why you need to sit down with Brian and Jeff and Alex and Bernie, the people at Acres Financial to determine whether an annuity is right for you. So the question is, is it right for you? Maybe, maybe not. They don't know until they sit and they visit with you. No financial advisor can say with upon first meeting you that annuity is what you need. They need to do a little bit of background and find out more about you and if it actually makes sense. And in considering, there's a couple of questions you should be asking yourself. One, do you want to position yourself to grow during a quick market recovery? while avoiding the harm if this pandemic economic effects continue. We've seen the market come back, it's great, but it could be that it, this could be a long lasting effect and we're just seeing a blip. We don't know. You wanna position yourself to grow and then avoid that, annuity might be right for you. Do you wanna lock in profits during a volatile market using a guaranteed accumulation annuity? If the market's gonna go like this, do you want to lock in your gains, uh, get a guarantee of 3%, 2.5%, whatever the number is, whatever's available, maybe? Do you want to learn about a strategy that loves a bull market, avoids losses in a bear market, and thrives during volatility? If that's the case, talk to, talk to the people at Acres Financial. Talk to Brian or Jeff or Bernie or Alex. And lastly, do you want to end financial stress by optimizing your retirement, specifically your retirement income? These are four great questions to ask yourself and ask, ask all the questions you need of Acres, Acres Financial. Brian and Jeff, again, Brian, Jeff, Alex, and Bernie, they know these annuities inside and backwards. Most importantly, they know how they fit together within a well-diversified portfolio utilizing all the financial tools available. The beauty of Acres Financial is they do have a universe of financial tools, products, strategies available to help you. I hope this has been helpful for you. Hope you got a little bit better of a picture of annuities. And again, I want to thank you for your time. And Brian, thanks for letting me be a part of it. Thank you, Sam, for your excellent talk on annuities. Um, at Acres Financial Group, we use fixed annuities as a way of providing protected investments and protected guaranteed income over your lifetime. The rest of this talk today is going to be brought to you by Acres Financial Group. And of course, my cousin, Jeff Acres, certified financial planner practitioner. He's worked with Acres Financial Group for um, 20 years now. So we welcome Jeff Acres to the stage. 
Thank you, Brian, and thank you all for being with us today, watching Winning in Retirement, the classroom edition. A lot of you get to hear us on the radio, and now you actually get to see us on the web. So we're glad you're here, but now you're wondering, what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about the goal of providing income. It's going to be predictable, reliable, there we go, sustainable, and inflation-adjusted income. That's very important for retirement. We want to make sure that you've got what you need to get all the way through retirement. Disclosures, we have to have disclosures for everything. You can always pause the screen and read all of these if you would like. I just want to point out a couple of important things. One is our broker dealer is Kalos Capital, located in Alpharetta, Georgia, and we provide uh, retired or investment advisory services through Kalos Management. Brian also mentioned I'm a certified financial planner, as is Brian and also Alex in our office. That's important from the standpoint of that means we are fiduciaries. That means that we put your interests before our own interests. All right, so this predictable, reliable, sustainable, and inflation-adjusted income. What is your strategy to have this throughout retirement? And do you have a plan in place to make sure that your money lasts longer than you do, or at least as long as you do? And is time on your side? Time's an interesting thing. When we're young, we've got a lot of time to save and accumulate money so that we've got a big nest egg when we get to retirement. But then when we're in retirement, we've got to make sure that we've got enough money to last the time that we're going to be retired. We are living longer. Now this chart is a little bit dated. It's from back in 2014, but I think you'll get the point. The idea is if you're healthy at age 65, what are the odds that you're gonna live to a certain age? And the bottom one there talks about a married couple, a husband and wife, they're both healthy at age 65. And if that's the case, statistically speaking, there's a 50% chance that at least one of them is gonna live to age 92. And there's a 25% chance that at least one of them will live to age 97. So we're living longer. When we talk about his time on your side, when we get to retirement, we might have a long time to plan for. If you retire in your 60s, you might have to plan on 30 years of being retired. And are you going to have enough income to get through that? Next up is inflation. We need inflation adjusted income. If we're gonna live for 30 years, inflation could have a big impact on our retirement. This chart, you take a look at it and it shows inflation by the decades and you can see that it's kind of come down over the years, um, over the decades anyway, to this last, the decade of the tens, the 2010s, being at 1.77% is the average inflation rate over that time period. The 40 year average for inflation is right around three and a quarter percent, just a little bit above 3%. So you think 3%, that's not too terrible bad for inflation, especially if you look back at the 70s and you see double digit inflation and you think, well, 3% is not too bad. But what happens if there's 3% inflation over 20 years or 30 years? Let's get down here to, if you need $100,000 today to get by, In 20 years at a 3% inflation rate, you're gonna need $180,000, almost twice as much just in 20 years. And remember we talked about life expectancy. If you're retired in your 60s, we might have to plan for 30 years. Well, now we're looking at about two and a half times that, $242,000 that you're going to need per year uh, to get by. So what's your plan to account for inflation? Because inflation will be there over your, your time that you're retired. What about taxes? We all know that a couple of years ago, there was a tax law passed and uh, this, this little form, they, they promised for years that they were going to take your taxes and put it on a postcard. Well, they finally did it. And so here it is. It's very simple. You put some basic information on there, your name, your social security number, you write down how much you made last year and then you send it in. And because it's Congress, they are very uh, interested in your thoughts. And so they even put a little box down there so that you can write in what your comments are. Now, of course, that's a joke, but taxes historically are at low rates. This chart only goes through 2014, but you can see that the inflation rate is at a historic low. 
In 2018, this top marginal rate actually went down a little bit more from 39.6 to 37%. And that's the current top marginal rate. If you're having a hard time understanding your taxes, we can talk with you about that and help you to understand what is a marginal rate, what tax bracket are you in, and how can we account for that. But taxes are an important part of your retirement, and that's gonna be something we talk about a little bit later on as well. Now we want your income in retirement to be predictable. We want it to be sustainable. We wanna be able to keep up. So this shows the tale of two brothers. The first brother, the guy on the left there, he retired in 1990. He had $500,000 saved up and it was all invested in the market. He said, you know, I need $30,000 a year. So I'm gonna take 30,000 a year out of here. So he starts taking his $30,000 a year distribution. He didn't even account for inflation. It never went up over that 10 years. So he took out $300,000. But the stock market in the 1990s, you might remember, was pretty good, especially the last five years or so. And so at the end of that 10 year period, he had over $1.2 million saved up and he had taken out $300,000. He was looking pretty good. If you look at his brother, he gets to retirement age and it's 10 years later, he says, hey, this worked out great before for my brother, I'm just gonna do the same thing. So he's got $500,000 all invested in the stock market and he's gonna take $30,000 a year. And in his mind in 10 years, he's gonna have $1.2 million. Well, the market didn't do the same thing for him. It was not predictable. The first three years, it went down the stock market went down. And so he was taking out his money and the stock market was losing money for him. Had a couple of years where it recovered and then we had 2008 and the stock market went way down. And then 2009 was a good year, but it was too late. It didn't make up for it. So after the 10 years, he's got less than $100,000 saved uh, for retirement. He's got about three years left of income. Now we talked before about longevity if we're planning for 30 years, you've gone 10 and you've got three left, he's gonna run out of money uh, well before retirement is over for him. So we don't wanna be forced to take money from investments that can lose at any given time, that can go down at any given time. In the last session, you heard Sam talking about annuities, fixed and fixed indexed annuities. Those are a couple of tools that we use because they're guaranteed not to lose when the market goes down. So we want something that's going to be protected like that. Well, there we've got the 1.2. Now, this is a fun cartoon. It was out a long time ago. Husband's sitting there. He's doing some figuring on his laptop. He's probably an engineer. And his wife comes in the room and the husband says, honey, I've got it figured out. If we take a late retirement and an early death, we'll just get by. Now, it makes for a nice cartoon, it's funny and everything, but it's not what we want for our clients. This is one way to take care of that longevity risk. You just say, well, I'm gonna work really late and then I'm going to die not too long after that so my money doesn't have to last very long. We don't want that for our clients. We want you to be able to retire and then enjoy retirement for several healthy years um, before uh, you do finally pass away. So there are a few ways that you can take care of your uh, income needs if you're running out of money. If you need less income, so you can take smaller withdrawals to make it last longer, but that means you're going to reduce your standard of living. And we want you to be able to maintain your standard of living. Now retirement, it's not all one big thing. It's like any other part of your life. When you started your job, you were kind of a beginner and then you worked your way up and you kind of went through phases while you were working. Well, similarly in retirement, there are phases that you will go through uh, in retirement. The first phase that we talk about is called the go-go phase. And in the go-go phase, you are taking the trips that you never got to take before because either you never had the time, you didn't have the money, or you had kids that were living at home. My parents, when they first retired, they, uh, they went to Hawaii, they went to Alaska, they had a good old time uh, taking the trips that they had never gotten to take before. 
So that's the go-go phase. Those are the fun years. Uh, you get all the things done that you, you didn't get to do before. Next up is the slow-go phase. And this is where you can still get out and about. You're still independent. You're still doing some things, but you've already taken all the trips that you wanted to take. You've done all those really exciting things that you wanted to do. And when you go out now, it's mostly to go to the doctor and just get things taken care of that way. So we want to, during the slow go phase, your spending might go down a little bit because you're not you know, taking the big expensive trips. You just slow down a little bit. You're still doing okay, but you just slow down a little bit. And then finally, we get to the no go phase. And I think we've all uh, seen this in, in folks, uh, family and friends that have gone through this phase. And it's a point where you just can't get out. You can't do things anymore uh, for a variety of reasons. And so in the, in the no-go phase, you know, we hope that that's a short phase uh, for folks, that you, you don't live like that for a long time. But it can be an expensive phase because you might need help. You need people to come and help out uh, with, with your care during that time. And so your income needs to continue to take care of you even in the no-go phase when you're not going anywhere. So your income needs through retirement are gonna vary. Usually it starts out a little bit high, then it might go down a little bit, and then it could end high again as you need care. So what about options for income? We've got various sources and various ways that we can take income. First up is social security. That's an important one for most people, unless of course you work for the federal government and you have the old system. Uh, they call that the CSRS system. There are Roth conversions that you might use. Um, protecting some from market losses, protecting some of your assets. We talked about that a little bit uh, ago when we talked about the two brothers. Sam talked about this a little bit when he was doing his annuity talk and the fixed and the fixed indexed annuities, just a way to protect against market losses. And then income producing options. What are some things that we can use that are gonna generate income, but we don't have to sell them in order to uh, meet our needs. And then what are some tax strategies, some ways to make our distributions, our withdrawals from our assets tax efficient? So we're gonna run through these uh, real quickly. Social security is a very important decision that you have to make. And it's a big money decision. These examples are if you've got a $2,000 benefit and you start taking it at full retirement age, which they're using 66 at this point, and you're going to live to your average life expectancy. That's what this is showing. So for men, the decision on their own is worth almost $400,000. For ladies, it's worth about $450,000. Women tend to live a little longer, so their average life expectancy is longer they're going to collect that social security benefit a little bit longer. But look what happens when we're talking about a husband and wife. We're talking about an $850,000 decision. It's nearly a million dollars for many folks. And it's a decision that once you make it, you've got to live with it. So we need to go through what are the best strategies, the best ways to take our income from social security. Now, We've got some social security strategies that used to exist prior to 2015. Um, in 2015, there were some changes. The first two on here, claim and suspend, was a strategy that we really like to use where the high earner could claim but not take their benefit. And then the, the lower earner could actually start collecting based on the higher earner's benefit. Um, the next one about claim now and claim more later, um, was a, a nice strategy that we could use. And then the do-over. The do-over is just, I started it and I changed my mind. I don't wanna do it, I wanna do-over. And as long as you did that within the first 12 months, you paid back all the money that you received from Social Security, you got a do-over. It was a fresh start. You golfers, I think you called a mulligan when you just get to start over. Now the do-over is special because it survived the changes that happened in 2015. So after 2015, claim and suspend, it just doesn't work anymore. Uh, and that's because once the higher earner suspends his benefit, they automatically suspend the lower earner's benefit as well. So they're not getting that advantage. 
The claim now, claim more later, they call that the restricted application. They just did away with that. That doesn't exist anymore. But the do-over does still exist. So the bottom line is when you sign up for Social Security, once you start taking it, you have one year. After that year, you're locked in. And even during that year, you can change it. But when you change it, you've got to pay back all the money you've received uh, from Social Security. Now, there are some strategies that we deal with with regard to health care that involve Social Security because of Medicare as well. So it's a big decision and it involves a lot of different parts of your retirement income and the strategies we're going to use. Now, for retirement income, there are uh, three basic asset groups that we like to talk about. The first is your 401k, your IRA. That's money that you've saved for years, you got a tax break, you never paid any tax on any gains or anything, and now you're gonna take it out to live on, and those distributions are going to be fully taxable when you take them out. The next leg of our stool is just regular taxable investments. That's on the, the other side there. The regular taxable investments, that's money that you, know, you might have in a brokerage account, uh, even a savings account, uh, CDs and things like that. You just kind of pay tax as you go. And then the last leg is the Roth IRA leg. There are some Roth 401ks out there now. That's a way that you can save money after tax, but then the, uh, when you get to retirement, you take uh, qualified distributions, it's tax free. That's the money you put in plus any growth is tax free coming out of a Roth IRA. Now for all you engineers out there, you know that three legs on a stool like that make it balanced, it'll stand upright, and same thing goes for our retirement income. We like to have some in all three of these legs. If you get too far out of whack, too much in one and not enough in the others, then it's not stable. Now, another way of looking at this is the traditional IRA. This shows the tax deferred contribution at the bottom and then the tax deferred growth all the way up. But when you take it out, 100% taxable. The next one is the investments. You put in your money after tax. We're gonna call that your basis, what you put into it. But then down the road, any gains, so capital gains is going to be taxable. Uh, dividends is going to be taxable. Interest is going to be taxable. Capital gains and qualified dividends have a special tax treatment. It's better than regular income, but it is still taxable. And then the final uh, leg to that stool is the Roth IRA. And that's where we're putting money in after tax but then all the growth is totally tax free because when we take the money out in retirement, those qualified distributions, it's completely tax free. We like tax free a lot. And you can see by what's circled on there that the Roth IRA, the amount of that that's taxable is just that little bit uh, that you put in at the beginning. So that brings up a question. Is there a way to get money? I've been saving all these years to a traditional IRA or a 401k and I like the idea of a Roth IRA, should I get some money from that traditional to a Roth and is it possible to do that? Well, one reason to think about doing that conversion is that all the future growth is tax-free. Another reason is that future withdrawals, those qualified withdrawals are tax-free. Like I said, we like tax-free a lot. Also, there's no required minimum distribution for a Roth IRA. Traditional IRA, when you reach the age of 72, that did change this past year, 72, you have to start taking money out of your traditional IRA. With a Roth IRA, there is no required distribution, so it can stay there the rest of your life. If you're thinking about leaving money to your kids, it's a great way to do that because the money will be tax-free for them as well. That's the next one. Beneficiaries get tax-free money from a Roth IRA. And in 2010, they made a change to the tax code that made this ability to convert available to more people. Before that, if you had income over $100,000, you couldn't convert to a Roth IRA. In 2010, they got rid of that rule, so it doesn't matter what your income is, you can convert from a traditional to a Roth IRA. 2020, this year, has presented a unique opportunity for Roth conversions. We talked about taxes before. We're at all time low marginal tax rates. Then we had the coronavirus and the markets went down. 
So the value of your IRA may have gone down depending on what it was invested in. So this year presents an opportunity to convert some from that traditional to the Roth and removing from it's going to be taxed eventually, go ahead and pay the tax now while that's low, and then it will be tax free to the future. Now, when we're talking about income in retirement, we like to kind of break it up into three parts. I know there's five across here, but three basic parts. We've got that short-term income need. What are we gonna need soon? And what should that be invested in? We don't really want things that you're gonna need next year to be invested in the stock market because things like this year can happen. You know, the market goes down, but you need the money, and now you've gotta sell more of it just to get the money out that you need. We don't wanna be in a position where we're forced to sell while things are down. But then at the other end of the spectrum, what about our long-term needs? If we're gonna be retired for 30 years, there's some money I'm gonna to need to have at that 20 year mark or 30 year mark. So those investments, they can be invested in stocks and things that do go up and down because there's time for those to recover from a downturn like we've had this year. And then in the middle, we like to have some investments. They, they might go up and down a little bit with the stock market, but maybe they pay a dividend and we can use that dividend to help supplement our income. So we like to break down our income needs into buckets, short term, short term, mid term and long term buckets uh, for income. And that's one of the things that we do for our clients is help you see what you're going to need and when and then get it into the right place. So that brings us to a question. Are your current investments being monitored? Are you paying attention to what's going on with them? Do you have things in the right place for when you're gonna need it? One of the first things that Brian talked to me about when we started, I started working with him was that money has a purpose. What is the purpose for your money? And then that purpose determines how it should be invested. So do you know what you're going to need to earn for your income to last throughout retirement? And then we need to figure out what are the right ways to do that, to generate that income. So for your future income, you can see here, we've got the income plan. There's you, there's your heirs, there's charities. And then there's that final uh, person who's interested in it. And that's the IRS taxes. So we want to make sure that you have the income that you need to get through retirement all the way through retirement. Then maybe you want to leave some to your heirs and that's great. We can plan some strategies to leave as much as we can to your heirs. Personally, I like leaving a Roth IRA to your heirs because that's going to be tax free to them. And then you might have charities that you're interested in leaving money to. Um, and if you do that, of course, charities, they can be tax free. They don't pay tax. So let's leave them the IRA money that maybe is gonna be left over. It's going to be taxable, except the charity doesn't pay taxes. And by doing that, we can actually trim what goes to the IRS. But it's your choice, it's your legacy, it's your money. So thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to us talk, or me, talk about uh, retirement income and how to plan for that. And we thank you for watching Winning in Retirement, the Classroom Edition. Thanks very much, Jeff. I hope you've enjoyed our talks today. Um, my notes, what I read here is this. We had a good talk from Sam Payne, and Sam Payne did an excellent job of talking about annuities and how you use annuities um, during retirement years. Also have some notes on Jeff's talk. Honestly, when it comes to retirement income, you need to know your cash flow. You need to know your tax situation. We must be prepared for higher inflation. So make sure you do one thing, and that is this. If you're already a client of Acres Financial Group, let's review, based on the thoughts from today, how to apply it to your exact financial fingerprint. Acres Financial Group and our team of advisors are designed to talk about that with you, our existing clients. If you're not a client, we invite you for a free talk with one of our advisors. It can be done at uh, over the phone, it can be done on a Zoom meeting, virtual meeting, or it could be done live with a mask to mask meeting. Also, I wanna remind a few more things um, to you, and that is this. The retirement income thing today is being recorded and will be on our website, so you can hear it again 
or you can refer um, to other people to listen to this talk. That'll be on our website under webinars um, right, right away after this live um, show we're having today. We look forward to um, giving you the gifts from today for attending. Um, hopefully you get those in the mail soon. Also, we want to tell you about in two weeks, on Thursday, October 8th at 4 p.m., we're going to have Mark DiOrio, uh, Chief Portfolio Manager from Brookstone Capital Management, giving the third quarter uh, market report. A third quarter market report, we'll have that from Mark DiOrio. And then we'll have our own, Alex Monk and Bernie McVeigh, giving the Acres Financial Select um, update, market update, uh, on our own portfolio that's managed um, by Acres Financial Group through um, Brookstone Capital Management, where Mark DiOrio is the lead manager. Acres Financial Group has an investment committee, puts together ideas, and works with the portfolio committee of Brookstone to provide that kind of investment. So our next talk to me about investments and about the market. It's going to be um, good information. We invite you that in a two weeks, October 8th at 4 p.m. Thank you again for listening to our classroom session today, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Music